Hi, this is Ryan and Eric back again for requirement two of Radio Merit Badge. Uh, we're calling this um, an introduction on how radio waves travel. Be sure to have your workbook out and looking over this as we're reading through the slides. And um, go ahead and hit pause when you would like to fill something out in your Merit Badge pamphlet um, and uh, keep the workbook up to date as we move through. So with that, we'll get started with this uh, first page here, which is how radio waves travel. Some people think the whole idea of radio waves is magic, including me. Even though we can't really see radio waves, we often show them as a series of ripple lines like this, similar to ripples on water. Radio waves actually move. They move at the speed of light. How fast is the speed of light? Well, it's 186,000 miles per second, or approximately 300 million meters per second. The simplest form of radio wave travel is called line of sight. You'll learn that later, you'll learn later that radio waves called very high frequencies, or VHF, and higher depend pretty much entirely on line of sight. As shown here, someone transmitting radio waves from their location to yours is simply a matter of sending the signal straight across. This works well unless there's something in the way of the line of sight signal, such as a small mountain. That's why you'll often see antennas on hilltops so that their line of sight signal will travel farther. Even if there are no mountains in the way of you, line of sight signal, the curve of the earth will eventually make it impossible for the signal to reach someone far enough around the curve. Line of sight signals can bend a little, but not for long distances. That's where other forms of wireless radio come into play. Consider four cities lying along the curvature of the earth, San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, and New York City. We've already talked about line of sight radio waves, and we know they pretty much can't follow the curve of the earth. Even some transmitters designed to send radio waves around the earth will throw off some ground waves that won't go very far. This is where the ionosphere comes in. The, on the ionosphere is an interesting invisible cloud of charged particles that surrounds the Earth. This is one of the most interesting parts of radio because it has many effects on radio waves. If I'm in San Francisco, my transmitter and antenna will throw off radio waves at an angle up into the sky. When my signal enters the ionosphere, the radio waves bend back down toward the Earth as if they were being reflected off a mirror. While the ionosphere isn't exactly a mirror, it has a similar effect. My radio waves come back down to Earth at approximately the same angle they entered the ionosphere, and that can be detected by someone listening on my frequency where the waves get close to the ground. We call this reflection off the ionosphere skip, and the total up and down distance is called skip distance. What about people in Denver? People listening on my frequency cannot hear my signal because it has skipped over them. We call this area where the signal skips over the skip zone. After the first skip of my signal, it will reflect off the earth and head back out towards the ionosphere and then reflect again off the ionosphere heading back down to earth. Here, we show that it is somewhere near New York City where someone may be listening in. We call this second hop or second skip of my signal. My signal has gone all the way from San Francisco to New York City, not possible with line, or, line of sight or ground waves. And with a second hop, there is a second skip zone. In the case no one in Chicago will hear my signal 
because it's traveling too high for their antenna to detect. The total of both hops is called the second hop skip distance. There are two other interesting things that can happen with skip. Let's say I position my antenna in such a way as to lower the angle my radio waves travel to the ionosphere. They will reflect back down at that lower angle, making them go much further like I'm showing here. Now my, my first skip hop got my signal all the way to Chicago, while on the first try it didn't go quite as far. On the second hop, the signal travels over New York City and someplace in the Atlantic Ocean, maybe a tropical island. Finally, I might position my antenna so that my radio waves angle up too sharply. They will deflect a bit, but they will end up going right through the ionosphere into space. No one will hear them except an alien or possibly an astronaut. Now, let's look at what really is amazing. This skip effect can take a radio wave signal all the way around the other side of the Earth. What's really crazy, signals can sometimes skip their way completely around the Earth and I'm able to hear my own signal. In our illustration here, it would take about 0 0.065 seconds to travel halfway around the world. So Ryan, if I could add one thing in here, this was a really hard thing for me to figure out when I was starting out my ham journey. But when it, when somebody explained to me that's like mirrors, so it's like a flashlight bouncing off one mirror to another mirror, then off another mirror, then another. Each one of those places where it bounces, if you think of it acting like a mirror, which is really what the atmosphere and the ground is doing, it makes more sense, at least it did to me. That's right, Eric. So um, in the example, our uh, um, different types of antennas will skip off of the ionosphere in different ways. So not going too far into those types of antennas, that's where those red and black lines from, from San Francisco, um, orienting them in different ways, will get uh, different lengths of travel for your skip. Uh, this is kind of where the, the idea of, a, of uh, radio waves being magical comes in because you can't see them and you can only learn by observations of either listening or seeing uh, information uh, on the internet as to where your signals have been heard. So go ahead and take a few minutes with this slide uh, to ponder this and you can use this slide uh, to help make a drawing in your workbook of how uh, propagation, ionosphere, and skip work. This is a requirement 2A. You'll see a grid picture in the workbook or you can just use a piece of paper. But sketch a diagram showing how radio waves travel locally and then around the world. This picture is certainly showing how it works around the world or propagating around the world. But that's what you want to be able to draw to complete this requirement. All right, very good. Next, we're going to talk about uh, WWV. What exactly is WWV? WWV is the call sign of the United States National Institute of Standards and Technologies radio stations near Fort Collins, Colorado. WWV uses high performance antennas to continuously transmit its signal and it can be heard all over the world. They transmit simultaneously on several frequencies. Their frequencies and time signals are controlled by atomic clocks located in Boulder, Colorado. NIST also operates the very similar radio station WWVH in Kauai, Hawaii using the same frequencies. WWV and WWVH make recorded announcements. Since they share frequencies, WWV uses a male voice to distinguish itself from WWVH, which uses a female voice. 
They also make other recorded announcements of general interest, for example, GPS satellite constellation status and severe oceanic weather warnings. Here we've got some an audio file where you can uh, hear what WWV sounds like. At the tone, nine hours, zero minutes, coordinated universal time. National Institute of Standards and Technology Time, this is radio station WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado, broadcasting on internationally allocated standard carrier frequencies of 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz, providing time of day, standard time intervals, and other related information. Inquiries regarding these transmissions may be directed to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, radio station WWV. 2000 East County Road 58, Fort Collins, Colorado, 80524. And there you have it. So when we get together in person uh, or have a virtual ham radio uh, station visit, we'll demonstrate WWV. Uh, it is um, almost always. Uh, broadcasting where we can hear it here uh, on the West Coast. And one thing that's uh, important about that that's in the requirements, it asks, how can it be used to help determine what you'll be able to listen to with a shortwave radio? And I think uh, Mr. Weber can add to this, but they listed the frequencies like 2.5 megahertz, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz. So if you can hear it really loud at a frequency, and you know you're trying to listen to something else close to that frequency, you'll probably be able to hear that, that station. If you can't hear it, if there's a, as Mr. Weber said, a storm or whatnot that's disrupting radio propagation, you can't hear WWV, the chances are you're probably not gonna be able to hear um, that station you're trying to tune in. That's exactly right, because uh, different, uh, stations like WWV and WWVH um, broadcast from locations all over the world. So if you would like to know if 10 megahertz is open to the Denver area, you can tune to WWV on 10 megahertz. And if you can hear WWV, then 10 meters is, as we say, open, and you can listen to stations in that part of the world. If you listen to 10 megahertz and you can hear a female voice on the WWV frequency, then you know that 10 meters or that frequency that you're listening on is open to the Pacific where WWVH is broadcasting from Hawaii. Different countries, uh, many countries around the world have stations broadcasting similar to WWV and you can use those frequencies um, to your advantage to know whether you can hear that in that part of the world. So with that, we'll talk about distant contact. So here in this slide, can you guess what the abbreviation DX means? It's shorthand for distance. In Morse code, it's uh, the shorthand means distance. There's no exact amount of distance defined for DX but we say DX communication is over great distances using the ionosphere to react the transmitted radio signal. DXing is the pursuit of distance sta distant stations with the goal of earning various awards. Now DX can be used also, the, the term can be used for uh, UHF and VHF uh, transmissions, which are more line of sight, uh, but DX may mean a different state or a different uh, country, in our case, uh, talking to somebody in Canada on VHF frequencies would be considered DX. A de-expedition is a trip to operate in a rare DXCC entity, such as one in Scarborough Reef in the South China Sea. You can see in this picture that the uh, ham radio operator is set up with, uh, with a station on, on the left side of the picture is the antenna is on a mast behind him and the generator providing power is on the right side of the platform. That's taking uh, DX transmitting to, uh, to an extreme. 
So real quick on that, if if I talk to you here in West Seattle, from West Seattle, that probably isn't DX. No. That would make me a local contact. That's right. Okay. But in, but in the case where you could make a contact uh, on the HF bands uh, by skipping off the ionosphere, uh, contact to Mexico or Peru or Japan, that's considered DX. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. Okay, because radio has no boundaries, radio waves don't stop at borders, the countries of the free world get together and make formal agreements on how radio should be used. It is up to each country to create their own laws, which ensure they abide by the international agreements. A formal international group has been created to coordinate the agreements between countries. This international group is called the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU. The ITU coordinates the agreements in the form of treaties between countries and has headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. The U.S. agency that our government has created and enforces laws to help us fulfill the international treaties is called the Federal Communications Commission. Nearly all who transmit radio signals for any purpose are required to register are required to be registered and licensed with the FCC. The FCC is the agency that assigns those call signs we talked about earlier in requirement 1C.